Welcome to your Hope-Filled Perspective with Dr. Michelle Bankson. I am delighted that you have decided to spend a few minutes of your week with me. You know, we all struggle with pain from our past. Places where brokenness continues to cut deep into the fabric of our soul. And if you've ever felt stuck or really are there now, you want to tune in today because no matter where you are on the path to wholeness, our discussion today will comfort, equip, and challenge you to keep pressing forward past brokenness to healing. Scripture tells us in John 14, 27, I'm leaving you at peace. I'm giving you my own peace. I'm not giving it to you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Today, we are going to be talking about how brokenness is not our destiny, but instead is the very thing that can lead us into a deeper experience of freedom in Christ. I've got the perfect guest to talk about this today. It's my friend, Jennifer Watson, who is the author of Freedom, The Gutsy Pursuit of Freedom and Life Beyond It. I was honored to read this before it ever came out in stores and endorse it. And you know, if I endorse a book, I'm fully behind it. Jennifer is a pastor's wife, the mother of two teenage girls, so pray for her, <laughs> a speaker. Jennifer has been in full-time ministry for 20 years and is passionate about investing in others. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on your Hope-Filled Perspective today. And thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here with you. You and I go back several years, but this is the first chance that my listeners are getting introduced to you. So tell us just a little bit about who Jennifer is. Well, um, I've been in ministry for 20 years. I am what I call a recovering broken girl. I came from a broken home and had a lot of you know trauma in my childhood, but um, just always had this wild eyed hope that God could do something with it. So I'm just someone who's very passionate about talking honestly and openly about brokenness and how we can move beyond it because I've experienced it. I know what it's like to be stuck. I know what it's like to be fixated on all the wrong things. And I experienced this breakthrough that I felt like, you know, everybody needs to experience. And that is why we can be friends because we're both recovering broken girls. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I love that you're willing to share about it because yeah. I think more people need to be willing to talk about those broken places, right. both to heal, but also to offer hope to others. And that's what this program is all about. Where did your passion for women's ministry come? Because I know plenty of people who say, oh no, I don't even like women. The last thing I want to do <laughs> is get involved in women's ministry. So what led you down that path? I think to realize that all women... Um, whatever season that they're in or trying to get over something. So that connects us. Um, I did, I did as, uh, you know, we were in our 20s starting ministry and I thought I am so unqualified. But, um, you know, working with people who had experienced trauma or brokenness and just feeling that strong connection, it just really lights me up. I don't want to go and quilt or do any of those things. <laughs> I want to go and talk about, hurts and awkwardness and moving forward in life like sign me up for that I just love it you've written a book about pursuing freedom will you share with us a bit of your story what that brokenness was like and how you were able to find hope during some of the hardest places in your life Yes, um, I'm pretty honest and open about struggling with anxiety and depression. It is something that I wrestled with. And so whether that is a result of trauma from childhood or whatever it is, it's something that I experienced. So I felt a lot of stuckness in my life, meaning that I kept circling the same issues. I kept dwelling on the same things. And it all came from a place of I'm not enough and insecurities. And so I went to counseling. Um, I have a mentor in my life who would call me on the carpet on things and just say, okay, you're fixating on the wrong things. Um, I let some pretty big haired Southern girls speak into my life and um, offer me hope and encouragement, but also called me out on some things. And so that was gold to me. So I've been there. I know what it's like to 
feel completely held back by uh, these issues that you're, you can't get over. And so whether that's from unforgiveness, whether that's shame, whatever it is, you know, I, I really truly understand how we can get caught up on that and think that that's all that we deserve when God's promises are for us. You know, not just for other people, but for us. And his grace is for all of those pieces of our stories. So um, it's just something that you have to be gutsy and pursue it until you really feel like you're growing. Mm, So very true. I remember many years ago at a church that I was attending at the time and heavily involved in women's ministry. But, you know, women can be catty. Yes. And there is no shortage of opinions when you get a group of women together. But I remember some women really kind of speaking negative about the pastor's wife because she didn't attend the women's Bible study. Mm -hmm. And God gave me a different perspective on that because as a neuropsychologist, when I went through depression and needed counseling, I drove 90 minutes each way to attend counseling. I knew that I needed help outside of myself, but Mm -hmm. I also knew that it wasn't real safe for me to share within my immediate circle. I had Mm -hmm. colleagues that I could have gone to, but First of all, they were my colleagues. And so I don't know how objective they could be. Second of all, I feared that they might not keep my confidence or they might stop referring to me because I was somehow less than. So Mm -hmm. I drove the 90 minutes away. But in that process, the Lord showed me that's how difficult it is for pastors, pastor's wives, Mm -hmm. ministry leaders, because you can't just share to everyone. No, you know, I mean, the, yeah. the congregation doesn't need to be knowing about the spat that the pastor and his wife had that last week, you know, right. there needs to be some sacred space, but mm. I applaud you mm. for going to a counselor for taking on a mentor to be able to help you with those things. How did you get to that place? Because I know for so many in ministry, that's a really hard step, but by not taking that step, they're also Mm -hmm. held back. Right. Well, I felt lonely. I think that that was the number one thing. And I think that you can't ask for someone for directions um, when they've never been where you're going. And so I realized that if they were not in ministry or had been in ministry, that they really couldn't speak into those areas of my life. So I've grown up in the ministry. It's been 20 years. So I started out like 21, 22. So we were babies and we've kind of grown up into it. And so uh, people really do look at you at, in your age bracket. You know, when God gives us that mantle of authority or that anointing, at no matter what our ages are, but we still need to learn and grow and glean. So I started reaching outside of the church. And what happened is I felt like my hands were being tied in ministry inside of my church during the season. Well, God started opening doors for me outside of the church where I could just be Jennifer Watson, the minister, you know, Jennifer Watson, the girl who's coming to talk about brokenness, that kind of changed everything for me. And I realized I had to build a tribe outside of the four walls of the church because people who identified with ministry or understood or just people who shared the same passions. And so I do have close friends in the church, but I do have a tribe outside of the church that they're my safety net, you know? And so I think you're realizing I needed that and I needed to make time for it because we're so busy. Right. So I had to schedule time to, you know, get to know other women and invest in those relationships. And that was gold to me still is. As you did that, and spent some time with your tribe outside of the church. Mm -hmm. Did that change how you interacted with those inside the church? I think that, um, oh, of course. Yeah. I think that there's, when you're healing in a place where you need healing in your life, you're not going to necessarily go to your church people. But I did have those kind of uh, spiritual mamas in the church that I did go to. They did know when I was in a fog of depression and it is so funny because I felt like it was so heavy around me, but I'm one of those high functioning depressed people when I'm going through it, that you just keep pressing on and you keep showing up and you keep going to, you know, those places. But like God has given me so many wonderful people inside the church and outside of the church. But then he's also given me this ministry to where, um, I know my place and I know my role, but I also know, um, 
I'm not leading through insecurity like I used to be because of breakthrough, because of freedom. Listeners, we're going to take a real quick one minute commercial break, but stick with us to hear Jennifer share more about pursuing breakthrough and what life is like beyond it. Welcome back to your Hope Filled Perspective. Today, we're talking to Jennifer Watson, the author of the book, Freedom. So let's start there. Jennifer, what's the definition of freedom? And then share with us, what's the definition of breakthrough? Yeah. So um, freedom to me is a holy confidence of just walking who God has created you to be. Yes, we have brokenness. Yes, we are flawed people. But there's a holy confidence in how God wants to use us. Um, in our stories, in our circles, whatever it is that is worth pursuing. And breakthrough to me, there's a military definition and it's saying the advancement beyond enemy territory. And I love the visual picture of like storming through enemy territory, but not just going up to it, but going beyond it, like going past the fiery gates and the flaming bullets or whatever it is and going beyond it to take back what we have lost and stolen. So that definition of breakthrough reminds me of John 10, 10 that says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. And if we listen to that, because he's our enemy, right? So Mm -hmm. we're talking about enemy territory. That's what he does to us. And that can cause people to retreat. Yes. Your definition of breakthrough kind of, attest then to the second half of that verse that says, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. So what you're saying, it sounds like you're saying we have to be intentional about not retreating from those difficult places, but pushing through all the way until we get to the other side. Yes. No more running that when it's so painful, because I can tell you having been in private practice for over two decades, people are afraid to face their pain. So they retreat, right? We have a saying in psychology and that is that you have to feel it to heal it. Yeah. You can try to stuff it down now, but if you do, it's going to come out later and it's going to come out at the wrong time. And you're going to feel like it came out from left field. Right. You have to be intentional. And I think that's what you're getting at. You have to be intentional about breakthrough. How do you do that? I think that you have to be really tired of being tired and exhausted (laughs) and being, you know, like I think you just have to go, what I have done, this hiding and running from it is not working. I am still in pain. I feel stuck and I'm not making any progress and I should be over it. That's what people say. I should be over this by now, but if we don't face it, you know, um, so what we keep repeating in our lives, that is like, it says you need to pay attention here because there's still work to be done. And it's something that we don't need to be ashamed about. It's just saying, you know what, I'm going to have to strap on my warrior boots and go for it because this stuckness is exactly what the enemy wants for me. He wants me to be fixated on my promises, my, my problems instead of the promises of God. He wants me to be stuck. But when we say, I'm going to go beyond this and I am a, just ready to do it. So it's being intentional and saying, I'm not going back to hiding anymore. I'm going to face this head on, no matter how painful, no matter how long it takes until I'm on the other side of it. It's just advancing that territory. I laughed because... When you said you've got to be tired of being tired, I remember when I was at the worst point in my depression. And that was when I was just like, okay, Lord, what I'm doing is not working. So show me what the missing link is. Mm -hmm. And so I have frequently said since then, desperation makes you willing. Yes. It made me willing to try whatever the Lord told me I needed to do to get through that depression. And was it hard work? Oh my word. Yes. There were many days that I just thought this is just too hard. Right. For me, my motivation was my children. Yes. This is going to end with my generation. They are not going to have to deal with. So it means I've got to be willing to do the hard work. So when you say you were just tired of being tired. Yeah. That's some good motivation right there. Yes. Yes. Well, and I felt the same way about my girls. I was like, no, no, I'm not passing on my issues. They're going to have to get their own. You know. (laughs) And so that meant uh, working through insecurity, 
that meant working through uh, the shame or fear cycle. That meant facing things head on because I can't lead them places where I'm unwilling or too timid to go. And so that was a huge motivation to me is that I wanted to mother from a place of wholeness. Now we do have broken moments and that is just inevitable because we live in a fallen world. But to know that God is going to be so much bigger in those situations. And so I'm very honest about my struggles with my girls, but I also am very um, careful about the things that I'm dwelling on and fixating on um, just because they're listening and they're watching yeah. and I don't want to teach them how to be insecure. I want to teach them how to be overcomers. Right. Your definition of freedom as, as a holy confidence is so accurate because we're not in this battle alone. Right. We often feel like we're fighting mm -hmm. it alone, but we're not. God's word says over and over and over again that he will never leave us. Mm -hmm. In fact, he says that he will fight for us if we will only just be still. Yeah. I think so often we spin our wheels mm -hmm. and we're not very effective if we would just realize God will help us fight this fight. Right. We're not in the trenches and we can have that holy confidence because of all the promises he's given mm -hmm. us. Right. Every person has experienced some kind of trauma or brokenness. And if they haven't, just hold on because it's coming. Yeah. And I don't say that to be um, a Debbie Downer, mm -mm. but Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trials, but right. take heart because I've overcome the world. Yeah. God meets us in those places and those seasons, but how can we know when we've become stuck in that broken place and can't move forward? Yeah. My biggest thing is where do your thoughts go? You know, where do they wonder? And if they wander back to that place where uh, there's pain or there's um, something that you can't get over, maybe you've got to forgive yourself. Maybe you need to forgive others, but if you're fixated on something that tells you that you're stuck on it, like that you have something that you need to work on because you, all you can see in your everyday life is that, that pain or that trauma or that offense, you know, that you're carrying and it's a pretty big load, you know? So when we start fo focusing on problems instead of the promises of God, we're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when we're doing the dishes, and all we're thinking about is that injury or that insult or that offense that we right. 10 years ago. Yeah. Or you're having that imaginary conversation with that person that you really wanted to tell off, you know? <laughs> I like, do know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> so I think that it's those things that we, it's, it becomes a hurdle for us because there's something inside of us that wants to go back and fix it, but we can't do that. We can only go forward and let God heal us from it. And we were talking earlier about how it's healing to share our story, whether it's yes. with a counselor or a mentor or a trusted friend. But that is different than every conversation we have with our friends are yeah. talking about the same issue. Right. That's where we're stuck. Yes. It's good to share our story. It is good to get outside help and opinions. Right. But it's not so good for our conversation always to be centered on these hurdles. Right, right. Well, and I think that you kind of know your people that you can vent to and they will like say, yeah, you should be mad about that. Those are not the people that we need to go through, no. go to in moments like this, but we can find it. And so would you feel the need to feel justified and gather your army? Then that lets you know that there might be something there that you've got to address. And we've all been there and we've all done it. You know, right? Yes. so if you want to grow, you need to have people that are on the other side of that or ahead of you on the journey. It doesn't have to be about age. It's about where are they on the faith journey and have these people that are holding you accountable and that you're holding them accountable and that you say, we're going to make progress on this together, you know, and say, you know, have you complained today? Have you, um, harbored unforgiveness today? Like, you know, having those simple questions that you that people are allowed to say to you and that you have to answer honestly, that's accountability and it's effective. But you're right that they have to be the chosen few Yes, who can really be trusted to speak mm -hmm. truth in your life. I have a couple right. of friends 
and they have been given permission to speak yes. truth when they see things in mm -hmm. me that are not lining up with God's truth. Now, I'll yeah. be honest, sometimes I don't like what they have to say. Exactly. But if I allow the Lord to do the work, I will come around and realize, no, they were right. Right. They were right. right. And either I need to forgive or I need to repent or mm -hmm. I need to ask forgiveness or something, or I, I need to rebuke the lies that I've been listening to and go mm -hmm. get back into God's worth. So they yeah. have my permission, but it's a very select few. Yes. Yes. And I think that that is absolutely okay. And it needs to be. Okay. Yeah. You know? I agree. Our culture puts a high value on transparency mm -hmm. and authenticity, which is refreshing to see that coming about because I think for so long we lived in a culture that just wanted the perfect mask. Right that picture perfect ideal. They didn't want to deal with the messy. But why do we have a desire for those around us to be real in their own struggles? Yeah, I think that we have a, a deep desire for connection, which is how God's wired us, that we need other people in our lives. But we want to know others and we want to be known by them. The only way we can do that is by being vulnerable and sharing the broken pieces of our stories, this, the part of our stories that haven't quite healed yet, um, our victories, all of those things. It's all about connection and knowing others and being known. That's truly what we want. And whether that's with one person or five, it doesn't matter the number as long as you have someone who knows you. You know, I think that that's so vital and important to us. So we share our stories because we want to be known and we want to know other people. As women, I think more so than men, we have a tendency though to compare ourselves to others. Yes. And we can compare how bad our life or our baggage is to yes. how bad someone else's is. Where do we go with that? Yeah. Well, it, what I was saying to you other, uh, earlier is that we have this uh, tendency to one up one another, like, oh, well, you know, you had a gash in your leg. Well, I had a whole gash everywhere, you know, whatever, you know, where you're just like, oh, I've experienced, but it's, it's that we want to like identify one with one another, but sometimes people just want us to sit with them in their pain, like that we don't have to have the right words or the answers, but I think that sometimes we fear silence and we fear pain. So we run our mouth. You know, yes. because, because we're trying to take away the awkwardness or yes. the feelings of it being uncomfortable. So I think it's just being intentional about that. You Isn't know? that exactly what happened with Job? I mean, Job had all these horrible things happen. Yes. Friends came and they sat with him yes. in silence for a week mm -hmm. to feel what Job was feeling, to commiserate with him, mm -hmm. but they got in trouble when they opened up their mouths. Yes. You know, I think we do the same. Mm -hmm. Either sometimes we, we one up on the pain, mm -hmm. really just want to be heard. We just right. want people mm -hmm. to recognize we're hurting. Right. But I've also seen it go the opposite way yeah. where someone has shared their story, shared their hurt, but then they've said, but I know that doesn't even come close to what you're dealing with. Right. The response is always, but pain, is pain. Yes. You can't compare pain. And there's no prize for who right. has the hardest hardship. God right. wants to be in all of it and right. heal all of it. Yes. Yes. And I think as women, we naturally want to fix things. We and do. so, you know, we want to be fixers, but we are just supposed to be present with others in their pain. And that kind of takes the pressure off because we're worried about saying the right thing. So that, that's a good thing. And another thing on the other side, if we're the ones that are hurting or going through some, something, we can't look to other people, flawed humans, and say, fix me. You right. know, I can't look to my husband and say, help me be less insecure. That's between me and the Lord, you know? So I think that that is where a lot of growth in my life has come through too, is not looking at people to be the answers to my problems. That that was a me and Jesus working it out you know, going to counseling, prayer journaling, whatever it is, you know, to kind of make progress is something that was so connected to my relationship with the Lord and not anybody else. Absolutely. Friends, we're going to take a real quick one commercial, one minute commercial break, but I want you to stick with us because Jennifer's going to share more with us about pursuing freedom and breakthrough and life beyond it. 
Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective where today we're talking with Jennifer Watson about finding freedom and breakthrough for the difficult places in life. Jennifer, you share about a gutsy girl mandate in the opening pages of your book, which I just love. Will you share with us what that means? Yes, I'm going to read it to you, but I, when I was writing this, it was one of those holy moments. Not every writing session is where you feel like, you know, that God's just opened up the heavens and right there with you. Uh, some of it's kind of boring and dull and the research and editing is not fun. But when I was writing this section, um, I had tears in my eyes and I just really felt it. And it was like something for me that I was like, I'm going to cling to this because this is what pursuing breakthrough looks like. And it says this, I am not stuck. I am steady. I'm not a lost cause too much or not enough. I'm worth fighting for. I'm ready to make good use of my brokenness because God already paid for my wholeness. Mm -hmm. I will not be the only one standing in my way. And that is where it all just kind of changed in the whole direction where I was like, this is what I want us to camp out, that we do not have to be the ones standing in our way, that we can stop looking at ourselves as too much or not enough or too broken to just say, God's already paid for this. So I'm going to pursue it and I'm going to get out of my own way on this. I think that's powerful. How do you use that gutsy girl mandate in your life now? Just say, you know what you feel stuck right now but this is temporary so another thing that I kind of camp out on in the book is that what I'm feeling right now is temporary what I'm facing is temporary and even if I can't see the good things in it right now that God will use it and use it for his good and my good and so when I take and look at my problems like that with the assurance that he's going to turn it around and make something beautiful out of the ashes um, that, that is a hopeful assurance. And that says, I'm going to look for that instead of fixating on what I'm feeling right now. And there is power in focusing on the problem solver yes. instead of the problem. Yeah. We're in the place that we're in because of our limited human nature. We yeah. can't see what's to come. Mm -hmm. You know, I often talk about, we can just see the puzzle piece of where we are right now, but God's right. the whole finished picture. Right. And so if we can focus on him, mm -hmm. he's the one who solves the problem. Right. But I think what you've been saying all along is where we get stuck is when we're spending too much time focusing on the problem. Yes. Yes. But that gutsy girl mandate is really focusing on the promises of God. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. I, because I heard as you were reading it, I thought that's scriptural. That's, mm -hmm. that's yes. scriptural. And, it, yeah. and there is power in speaking God's word and praying God's yes. word, and meditating on God's word. Right. And where we get in trouble is when we focus and meditate on the enemy's lies that we're listening to. Right. But right. If we can refute it with what God says. Mm -hmm. it's done deal. Right. Every time God says, will, it's going to happen. Yeah. We yeah. just have to be willing to hang on. And that's yeah. the hard part when you're in the middle of the mess. Is right. Hanging on. When does our honesty about brokenness become an obstacle in our own healing? I think when we want to have, like I've said this often that I, in the past, I made really good friends with my baggage, that it became so tethered to my identity um, now when I share my story, people are like, no, that didn't happen to you. And the reason why is because those places in me are healed to where they can't see the lingering traces and the scars. And so I think that knowing that that doesn't get to be the focal point anymore. So when we're talking with others and we want to have a pity party, that's off, like the red flag is going off, you know, but we do that because it's because we don't want to be alone. So we'll kind of gather our little armies. But like, if that's all we're talking about, that is just a, a really a huge red flag for me personally and saying, all right, why do I need to keep talking about this? What am I looking for? Am I looking for affirmation or am I looking for someone to say, yeah, you should be frustrated or whatever it is. What am I looking for in this situation uh, to where that I would want the attention to be on the back, the broken things in my life. You and I have talked before about a negativity fast Will you yes. share with us. What you mean by that? Whenever, I mean, whether it's like, um, 
calling yourself out to where you're about to say something negative or if someone gives you a, a compliment and then you say, yeah, but my hair's greasy. I cannot tell you how many times I want to come back with something that is a flaw in my own life, you know, but when we can just stop Talk, letting the negative things rise to the surface and call ourselves on out on it like that is just powerful because then all of a sudden we're not fixating on those things anymore and it's just powerful so I think just calling ourselves out and saying today I'm not going to complain about anything you know and just giving ourselves that challenge yeah you know, I think it was just it's the it's hard but it's such a good thing to do. It is hard. I went through a stage in my life many years ago where it came to my attention that I was spending an awful lot of time complaining about things. So mm -hmm. I wore a rubber band on my wrist, not to snap it, you know, like no. <laughs> suggest that I don't like pain that much. But yeah. what I did do is when I realized I was complaining, I'd have to switch the rubber band to the other wrist. Yeah. So that it made me more aware yes. of just how often that was my focus instead yeah. of all the positive things that God was doing in and around and through me and for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. That was an eye opener. Yes. Something that can be done very inexpensively right now. Right. Right. Yeah right now yeah well and I, there's this quote that says you know interrupt anxiety with um gratitude and so i think interrupting negativity with praise um and positivity and all of the good things that god's done for us i think that that's a game changer in the way that our brains work and the way that we see problems absolutely if a listener is struggling with being stuck and needing a breakthrough, what hope-filled perspective would you want to give them today? Uh, like I said earlier, just to remind yourself, what I'm facing right now is temporary. What I'm feeling right now is temporary. If we can look at our problems as we are, this is just a small blip on the radar. We are passing through it. That there's going to be an end. There's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And to know that even if we don't see any good in that situation right then, that God is working out all things for our good. He's working all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So we can bank on his promises to where our problems don't get to steal the spotlight in our lives and in our stories anymore. So true. In your book, Jennifer, you said that breakthrough is a decision to move past what you are facing or have faced, not in denial, but in faith and determination with a Genesis 50, 20 vision. In Genesis 50, verse 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that sums up what freedom is, that holy confidence that whatever we have gone through, whatever we are facing now, it is temporary. And though the enemy did intend it for our harm, God will use it for mm -hmm. our good. So we mm -hmm. have to cling to him and hold on to the problem solver without focusing so much on the problem. Right. And therein will be our holy confidence. Yes. Thank yes. you for sharing your yes. story with us and writing freedom so that we can attain breakthrough. This has been your hope-filled perspective. Until next week, may you have a hope-filled week.